morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Jason E. Bowman, and I'm the program leader of the master's program in fine art here at Valland Academy. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the seminar, um, Anatomizing Museum, Contemporary Art Museum Collections, the Medical and Social Body. I want to explain a little bit about the rationale for um, the seminar and its coming about. Um, for the past five years, um, the MFA program here has been developing projects in specific sites or contexts, um, most often with um, its first year um, studentship. And these projects have taken place in a variety of sort of contexts, um, from um, protected um, spaces on um, archipelagos of, um, with uh, ecological um, sort of value, um, through to stately homes such as um, Shula Hom, which is um, the place where Lars von Trier made melancholia, you know, sort of um, last year to an archaeological dig here um, in Niederlose, um within the city of Gothenburg. Um, quite often these collaborations have occurred within heritage contexts, um, so not solely within the museum or the museological. Um, and it seemed after five years that um, it was an appropriate moment to begin to maybe think through some of the key issues that have um, appeared over the duration of these projects. I mean, obviously, I'm not so young. Um, and what we have found out from working with um, students over generations of time is that we are seeing different approaches towards um, site specificity, different approaches towards understanding um, museological and heritage context. So part of the rationale for today was to have a public conversation about um, the nature of some of the questions that have arisen from it. Um, we've taken a very wide and broad view to the seminar. You know, sort of, um, the seminar is populated by a series of um, individuals from multiple disciplines. There are multiple um, artists um, who will address um, the seminar today. There are people who um, operate in museum context, and museum professionals, and there are people who work from curatorial dynamics. Um, some people are trained as art historians, some as artists, some, some people have um, slipped into the museological frame in a variety of different ways. Some people are specialists in learning in relation to sort of um, museum context, etc. So it's quite a broad sort of dynamic that will be at play in order to inspire sort of dialogue and conversation. Um, this year, the project that the first year students are currently working on will take place um, within the Medical History Museum here in Gothenburg, of which um, Lisa uh, Spitness-Mervitz is um, the director. And we're delighted to have a collaboration with them. That sort of um, situation and context in the museum is within the framework of um, a teaching hospital, um, which is also affiliated to the university. Our work on these programs has been highly supported by two other frameworks within uh, Gothenburg University, the Heritage Academy, which is a co-funder of um, today's event, and also the Department for Critical Heritage Studies here, which is um, a significant department in terms of sort of interrogating notions of both material and immaterial cultures within heritage contexts. Um, and perhaps unusually for a critical heritage studies department, they have deeply affiliated themselves with the concept of contemporary art at the same time and very deeply engaged um, with the academy here and with our students. So I want to thank them for their um, support. A couple of basic housekeeping things. There's a fire exit here. Um, there's also a fire exit by going back down the stairs that you came up. The gathering point, should there be a fire, is just beyond these gates here and the bathrooms are downstairs. So I am happy to um, introduce um, Lisa Spitness Movitz. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to say that I'm also very glad to have this collaboration with Valand Academy. Uh, Gothenburg Medical History Museum has, uh, the last uh, couple of years, been collaborating with artists in different forms. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more in the afternoon. Um, yeah, I think I'm happy there. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Um, 
So just to return a little bit to the format of today, the panels are not like super thematized, um, but what we're hoping is a set of thematics or questions um, or observations around these kind of key, key questions um, regarding this sort of interface of museological practice with artistic practice. Um, we'll begin to sort of um, unravel through the, the set of um, presentations um, that take place and, and we'll potentially investigate the question of the relationship between sort of um, heritage criticality, museum criticality, and the criticality that's actually fundamental to contemporary art as a discourse. Um, so to begin today, you know, so we invited Miranda Stern, who's head of learning at the Fitzwilliam um, Museum in Cambridge in the UK. Um, and Miranda has been conducting research into um, the dynamics and histories of artists' interventions within museological contexts while I'm conducting her PhD study at the Courtauld Institute in London, which is a world leader in terms of art, art histories. Um, and Miranda's coming from an art historic bias in relation to that, but, but she's also um, worked in a series of um, museological contexts um, herself before taking up her current post, but has also worked in heritage um, industries um, with the Heritage Lottery Fund in the UK. So I'd like to welcome Miranda. Good morning. Um, thanks for inviting me to join you today. I'm very much looking forward to our discussions. Um, and for now, I'm in a really privileged position of being able to kick off by sharing some of my own musings from my PhD research into artist interventions in historic art collections in England, primarily. Um, and I did just want to start with a caveat, given the title of the symposium today, um, which is to say I spent half of dinner last night weighing up whether to go home to the hotel and rewrite my presentation, as lots of my work has been very focused around art collections, which I know is not the context um, for, to, for this year's project. Um, and I do have a couple of more kind of science history related um, examples that I could have drawn on. Um, that might have fitted the workshop title better, but I thought the better of going home and revising because sometimes I think it's helpful to hear about practice that shares lots but comes from a slightly different perspective. So I hope that's sort of what I'm offering you today is some of the questions that have arisen in my work, particularly around the context of historic art collections. Um, so without further apologies, Summer 2012. At the National Gallery, London, the season's offering is headlined by Metamorphosis Titian 2012, three contemporary artist responses to paintings by Titian recently acquired for the nation. And I'm showing you an installation shot of it there. And you can see Comrade Shawcross's piece sort of through the galleries between the two Titians. At Tate Britain, Patrick Keeler's The Robinson Institute responds to Tate's collection by recombining a selection of collection works with other material to explore the current economic crisis. The British Museum's Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman, curated by artist Grayson Perry, has finished, but the museum proudly announces the acquisition of three of the key works created for the show. For those engaging with historic art collections, and indeed many other museum collections, contemporary interventions feel almost inescapable. Broadly speaking, my research explored how and why this should be the case, how we got here, and what impact this might have on how we experience the art of the past. I undertook this research project to understand better the phenomenon of museum commissioned artist interventions and to try and share that understanding back to those working in, with, or about museums, which is why it's a pleasure for me to be here today. My aim was to provide critical reflection on this particular area of museum and artist practice at a time when large numbers of museums were choosing to work with artists in this way. And I was very much, you know, in the museum sector in the UK. It was something that I, myself and my colleagues were doing a lot. Um, I believe artist and museum collaborations can have a powerful impact on how visitors experience museums and their collections and can be instrumentalized in different ways by artists and by museums. Like any powerful instrument, they're best used with consideration and understanding of their potential, of how they've been used before, of why they might offer the best solution to the task in hand. Amid the current enthusiasm for commissioned artist interventions, I began to feel that some of the space for critical reflection had been lost, at least among those working on the ground in museums. 
With this way of working increasingly feeling like the rule rather than the exception, I detected a risk that museums might be bringing in artists out of a desire to meet current expectations rather than a considered sense on either side of what specifically their collaboration might offer. My research, looking back over more than three decades of museum commissioned artist interventions, offers a contribution to what I see as a necessary period of reflection, something that today's event also um, contributes to and indeed I, you know, I've, there have been quite a few kind of conferences, symposia, publications, and over the last couple of years that I think have similarly tried to kind of fill this gap. Um, obviously, today we have limited time, so you'll be pleased here. I'm not going to attempt to encapsulate 40 years narrative and several years research into 30 minutes. Instead, I thought it would be interesting to focus on a few examples from different moments over these past kind of four decades. Um, which take a particular model for intervention, that of artist invited as curator, and use it in different ways to do different things. So, inviting an artist to make a selection from a permanent collection is a long-established model for museum commissioned intervention. So, inviting an artist to make a selection from a permanent collection is a long-established model for museum commissioned interventions, with examples emerging in the 70s with projects such as Andy Warhol's Raid the Icebox in 1969 and Anthony Caro's inauguration of the Artist Eye series at London's National Gallery in 1977, and that's actually going to be the first example I'm going to look at. There are many benefits museums might hope to gain from initiating such projects. These include the opportunity to provide an insight into the selecting artist's own ideas and the relationship between the artist's work and artistic antecedents, to make explicit the connection between old and new, connecting contemporary art to some idea of tradition, but also the sort of notion of revitalizing the historic art, and demonstrating its relevance in the present day, to introduce new ways of looking at the works or objects, to refocus attention on collection objects which might have become commonplace through familiarity on the one hand, or lesser used parts of collections, stored collections on the other, or to challenge expectations and disrupt museum narratives, replacing them with, on the one hand, maybe personal insights, on the other, revisionist interpretations which challenge the museum's claim to objectivity. So today I'm going to take you through three examples which use the idea of artists as curator in slightly different ways. The first comes from the National Gallery London. Um, so British sculptor Anthony Caro, sort of successor to Henry Moore, and by 1977 when this took place, strongly associated with abstract steel welded sculpture, you can see one there, um, made a selection of works from the National Gallery collection and displayed them alongside one of his own abstract sculptural pieces. Almost four decades on, it's easy to forget how surprising the juxtaposition of contemporary abstract sculpture alongside the National Gallery's paintings was to audiences at the time. For some, the bringing together of old and new seems too unlikely, too implausible to be sincere. And this is a quote from, a, um, from Malcolm Bradbury speaking on, a, on Critics Forum, which was a radio programme at the time. I quote, I think there's a very strong futurist element in Caro's work, that is to say, the desire to destroy the museum. I spent half the time thinking that Caro was playing a little joke on us, that the joke is here in the museum is an anti-museum piece. Now, I kind of wanted to start here just to show you, you know, to me, this is not an ad, this doesn't feel like a massively threatening intervention. It, it's hard for me to read that as an anti-museum piece. It's simply piece, it putting a piece of abstract art into the National Gallery, but that even that was considered quite threatening and radical at that particular moment in that particular institution. Um, for many others, however, Caro's selection proved illuminating, providing a context to his own work that made it easier to approach and to comprehend, as one Critics Forum participant expressed. I don't particularly, I quote, I don't particularly like the work of Caro, but I find myself much more sympathetic to his work when I came away from looking at the Bellini from looking at the Cezanne, because I could see that to some extent there was a successful attempt to explain by him where he stood in this continuity. Commenting on the project, Caro made his desire to emphasize continuity explicit, stating, I quote, what I'm keen to show really is there's no difference between abstract art and figurative art, the differences between good and bad, end quote. 
What might this emphasis on continuity across time do in terms of how visitors experience the collection works? Some at least consider it beneficial. I quote, its importance lies in its assertion of continuity, a two-way process which actually alters the look of the old by the light of the new. From this perspective, the main benefit derives from the potential these juxtapositions have to alter our perception of the old, the art in the collection, causing us to experience the collection works in a new way. The fact that this is a recurring sentiment within critical response highlights the importance placed on this transformative potential. I quote, I came away feeling that I'd never actually seen these paintings quite before, simply because, as it were, he was there gently nudging me, but not telling me what to think. And I think that's quite telling in terms of what artist interventions might do going forward. So following Caro's exhibition, the National Gallery decided to continue the initiative with nine more artist eye exhibitions, many of which, according to their visitors, also managed to suggest new ways of seeing old, familiar old masters. For the gallery's director, the hope was that these new ways of seeing would have a lasting impact on people's understanding of the works, that, I quote, the resonances and echoes identified here will accompany the pictures when they return to their usual neighbours at the end of the summer. In this sense, the Artist Eye series became about something more than presentation of an illuminating personal selection, instead offering a tantalising glimpse of the transformative potential of inviting contemporary artists to interpret the collection. In this case, transformative of visitors' experience of individual artworks. It seems logical that museums and galleries inviting artists to intervene should base their decisions about whom to approach upon something in the invited artist's previous practice, which suggests that the proposed engagement with the collection will be a fruitful one. In the case of the Artist's Eye series, many of the artists were London-based and were known to be frequent users of the gallery. During the 90s, however, some museums began to realise the possibility of an alternative criteria for selection, inviting artists not because their work had suggested a particular interest in the host museum's collection, but rather because their practice demonstrated a deep engagement with museums in general. Emerging in the 60s and 70s, these artists engaged in a wide variety of activity, including installation and performance art, but shared an interest in interrogating art world institutions with the consequence that their practice began to be referred to under the umbrella term of institutional critique. And indeed, in many ways, our conference today is framed around the questions that arise out of that practice and positioning. And so the second example I want to look at today falls into this category, um, and that's mixed messages, an invited intervention by Hans Hacker at the V&A in 2001. And when I saw I was sharing a platform with someone from the V&A, my heart battled a little, but I'm assured you weren't there at this moment, but feel free to heckle if you think I'm getting any of it wrong anyway. Um, so inviting practitioners of institutional critique into the museum is both deeply logical and deeply problematic, I'd argue. Um, for figures such as Hans Hacker and Fred Wilson, questions surrounding the workings of the museum have been central to many of their key projects prior to their museum commissions. In the context of the perceived need to make the case for continuing relevance of museum and gallery collections through highlighting contemporary artists' interests in those collections, it's easy to see the appeal for museum curators and directors. For the artists too, responding to museum invitations offered opportunities to push and extend lines of inquiry begun outside the museum through the unprecedented access and profile offered by being invited in. Nevertheless, the notion of invited critique can seem inherently contradictory, asking the artist to come inside the institution and thus jeopardise the external position which might previously have been seen as a prerequisite for critique. Looked at more positively, the increased frequency with which critique has been brought into the museum maybe reflects the convergence of this challenging artist practice with revisionist self-reflective trends emerging within museums and heritage and an awareness that by inviting artists to take the role of curator, they can be enlisted as enablers, facilitators or partners in this process. Hacker's turbulent and drawn out transition from external critic to internal collaborator can serve as a reminder that relations between museums and the artists who practice critique have not always been so amicable and cosy. During the 70s, two of Hacker's projects proved so unwelcome to the museums designated to host them that they were directly censored. 
In the aftermath of these incidents, it's perhaps unsurprising that for the next two decades, Hacker exhibited his projects directly concerned with museums and their pro processes, such as his Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum Board of Trustees, 1974, and Metro Mobiliton, 1985, in private commercial galleries or contemporary art settings. What's perhaps more surprising is that he returned to work within the museum at all, and conversely that curators and directors dared to invite him to do so. In 2001, in London, the V&A did just that. Give and Take was a two-site project resulting from a partnership between the V&A and the Serpentine Gallery, which, for any of you unfamiliar with it, is a contemporary art space in the middle of Hyde Park, not far from the V&A. Um, Give, Give and Take was a multi-artist project, and most of the artists did commissioned interventions within the V&A. Hacker worked in residence at the V&A, selecting objects, many from the museum stores, which he then used to create mixed messages and installation at the Serpentine, which you can see here. And you can see how he's brought together objects which within the V&A would sit in, and remember this is going back a while, the V&A curates itself slightly differently now, but at the time you know, these were from different depart curatorial divisions because they were from different places geographically and because they were made of different materials. Um, and you can also, you may, might notice, there's almost no labelling. Now it does look like there's something on the central pinth, but the others, there's no labelling. Um, so mixed messages used unexpected groupings of objects and a lack of written interpretation to encourage visitors to play an active role in creating meaning for the installation. In so doing, Hacker hoped to raise visitors' awareness that the interpretations of objects they encounter in conventional museum displays are not fixed but constructed. Hacker was particularly interested in prompting chains of thought relating to the V&A's institutional history and its relationship to power and empire, commenting, The Western world and its institutions, as we know, has a problematic history relative to the rest of the world. Colonialist, if not outright racist, attitudes towards non-Western people appear in the V&A's collections. The obnoxious examples in the V&A's collection offer an important historical perspective. They function as pieces of evidence. Aside from many other things, the V&A is a museum of the British Empire. End quote. Hacker considers it important that the imperial legacy become an active part of how visitors understand and respond to the museum. End quote. What museums should perhaps do is make visitors aware that this is not the only way of seeing things, that the museum, the installation, the arrangement, the collection has a history, and that it also has ideological baggage. End quote. Hacker's mixed messages can be seen as a strategy for achieving the same, and critical response suggests he was largely successful, with one critic describing the project as, I quote, the unearthing and reshuffling of historical and artistic objects from specific museum collection in order to bring out sublimated attitudes towards race, class, and political power. Nevertheless, most commentators shared the view that the post-colonial critique, while present, was considerably less biting than might have been anticipated given Hacker's previous projects. There was also a feeling that the laying bare of imperial resonances went hand in hand with an enthusiastic, appreciative response to the visual riches of the V&A's collection, which the visitor could not fail to pick up on and participate in. Indeed, several commentators used the image of Hacker, the fierce critic, having unexpectedly succumbed to the almost seductive charms of the collection, with one describing the outcome as, I quote, more of a pussycat's purr than a tiger's growl, which all but omits the customary outrage and moral superiority. End quote. Hacker himself attributes this apparent mellowing to a shift in focus away from looking at particular conditions in this institution at this particular moment, as he had done, for example, when he was interrogating the makeup of a board of trustees at, at um, the Guggenheim. Um, instead, taking the opportunity of working with the V&A to enact a broader meditation on, I quote, the institutions of art history and museums as such, of the ideological implications of museuming, of how artifacts are presented, and how that affects our understanding of society then and now, end quote. These Critical artist as curator projects as a subcategory of artist interventions can participate in transforming the museum from authoritative purveyor of grand narratives, undermining the false objectivity of impersonal museum interpretation 
and providing a succinct and compelling way of expressing the subjectivity of historical interpretation without resorting to extensive, sometimes abstruse text or a laborious summary of all possible explanations. In this context, hackers' juxtapositions within mixed messages prompt chains of thought about the VNA, its objects, and the impact of context on meaning that would take many lines of text to express, and even then not fully. And I think this is important, actually, if you've ever tried to write kind of nuanced museum labels that take into account the many conflicting possible histories of something, because you think, you know, that's the right thing to do, to not be authoritative and say, this is the one truth of this object. You realise you end up with, like, screes of text that no one wants to read, and actually there's something quite nice about the idea that there's a different way of, of getting that. Nevertheless, this modified role for the artist, working within rather than outside the museum or gallery, presents challenges in the context of the practice of institutional critique, as many commentators, including Hal Foster, Isabel Graw, and Miwon Kwon, have been quick to note. Hal Foster, for example, comments on the risk that the resulting work, I quote, often seems a museum event in which the institution imports critique, whether as a show of tolerance or for the purpose of inoculation, against a critique undertaken by the institution within the institution. I think that's quite interesting. Hacker himself challenges the implication that when an artist and museum attempt to collaborate, one side must necessarily outmaneuver the other, with collaboration taking on its most negative connotations. I quote, there are curators and administrators today who participated in the cultural revolution of the 60s, read the same books as we did, to the more adventurous among them, it's not as problematic as it once was to an extend an invitation to me. In turn, I do not consider myself automatically as being co-opted when that happens. End quote. Isabel Graw offers a slightly different take on the notion of artist as institutional ventriloquist, suggesting that curators turn to artists to deliver critical interventions not because they're unwilling or unable to take responsibility for doing so themselves, but because as insiders, they lack the position of authority to do so, creating, I, I quote, an absurd situation in which the commissioning institution, the museum or gallery, turns to an artist as a person who has the legitimacy to point out the contradictions and irregularities of which they themselves disapprove. End quote. Beyond the specific revisionist transformation affected, hackers' V&A intervention and others like it participate in a wider-reaching project of transformation in that they suggest the contingent nature of meanings ascribed to objects in museums. They make evident the constructed nature of museum narratives by constructing alternatives, and more importantly, maybe by encouraging visitors to become aware of the active role they must play in making sense of the collections of objects held in museums. In this light, we can see artist interventions playing into a set of ideals around a self-aware, reflective, and non-dogmatic institution that some commentators have framed as the post-museum. And um, this, I'm about to quote Janet Marstein, who's in the Museum Studies Department at Leicester, which, for those of you who are UK-based, means she is kind of shaping the next generation of museum professionals because they run one of the biggest kind of um, MA Museum Studies programmes. Anyway... This is her definition of the post-museum. The post-museum clearly articulates its agendas, strategies, and decision-making processes, and continually re-evaluates them in a way that acknowledges the politics of representation. The work of the museum staff is never naturalized, but seen as contributing to these agendas. The post-museum actively seeks to share power with the communities it serves, including source communities. It recognises that visitors are not passive consumers and gets to know its constituencies. Instead of transmitting knowledge to an essentialised mass audience, the Post Museum listens and responds sensitively as it encourages diverse groups to become active participants in museum discourse. I quoted this summary at length because it suggests how closely many intervention projects might be aligned with the wider process of change, which for some at least represents the most viable direction of travel for museums in the 21st century. Suggesting that artists have both helped shape this vision of what museums might be and continue to provide possible approaches for museums seeking to participate in this ideal. And now, for my third example, I want to look at the Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman, curated by Grayson Perry at the British Museum um, 
and this is 2011, 2012. So my first example was 1977. We jumped to 2001. Now we're in 2012. And I think it does something slightly different again. Um, and this is one of the drawings that, um, that Perry created for that show. And it also became one of the images, that, not exactly the poster image, but it was on a lot of the merchandise in the shop, for example. You could get a tea towel, I suspect. Um, so Perry's Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman at the BM, um, a collaboration initiated by the artist in a letter to the museum's director, brought together 170 objects from the museum's collection with 35 of Perry's own works. The premise of the exhibition was that it offered a glimpse into a lost civilization, like so many other sections of the British Museum, but that in this case, a civilization constructed by Perry and presided over by his personal deity, Alan Measles, who's Grayson Perry's childhood teddy bear. Um, visiting the exhibition was likened to a pilgrimage with Alan Measles as the subject of veneration, and lots of the objects Perry created for the show played into this idea. And this is, you know, a pilgrimage to the British Museum um, imagery there. Um, Perry explained how his project reversed the format of artist intervention projects with which museum-going audiences had by this time become quite familiar. We kind of, we know this format now. Um, I quote, it's become common practice in recent years for contemporary artists to make an intervention into a historic museum. When an artist is invited to respond to the collection, it's an artificially induced version of the process that has powered world culture forever. Makers of objects have been responding to objects made by earlier generations since the beginning of craft. When I began working with the British Museum, I thought, why not reverse this process of response? The BM holds 8 million objects from every age of corner of the globe. Why not, I thought, make the works I'm inspired to create and find objects in this vast collection that respond to them? So that's what he did. So in some ways, the Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman at the British Museum feels like a direct descendant of the National Gallery's artist eye exhibitions in terms of kind of finding your antecedents and putting them all in a room together. Um, and echoes abound in the language used to describe the project and its impact by the press, the visitors, the museum, and the artist himself. Most obviously, there's the notion of the exhibition as a highly personal selection, which reveals as much, if not more, about the artist selecting as the collection objects selected. So that whole artist eye thing. Um, there's the suggestion that the artist is particularly well placed to achieve these revelatory juxtapositions because of particular qualities bound up with his or her status as an artist. I quote, I'm here because I'm an expert of look at looking. That's my job. I look at things and I trust my in intuition and I make choices. End quote. There are also, however, um, echoes of institutional critique. Several pieces offer a strain of satirical social commentary, um, which is you know, very typical in Grayson Perry's work in general, including the Rosetta vase, which I'm showing you here, which he made, obviously, especially for the show, um, which turns its attention towards the figures of the artist on side and the museum institution. So among the words used to capture the character and aspiration of the latter are cultural diplomacy, merchandising opportunities, colonialism, contemporary art has added value, dry academe, non-traditional backgrounds, and a story of the world. Um, you can see there, iconic brand, nice day out, museum of, as cathedral. Um, so he's kind of pulling these, these buzzwords that are, it's not me, is it? <laughs> um, that are the buzzwords of our sector at the moment. Um, yet for all this, um, Perry's project doesn't sit quite comfortably within the field of institutional critique. It's not simply the wit. Institutional critique artists such as Andrew Fraser and Fred Wilson um, employ humour among their critical strategies. But the warmth that runs through the exhibition, a depth of feeling conveyed through the very personal nature of Perry's response and the story he weaves, um, and also equally importantly, the response he demands from the visitor. So to me, it seems simultaneously an exploration and a celebration of the role the exhibition and the museum more generally might play in people's lives. The exhibition is only in part about Perry's relationship with the collections of the British Museum. It's as much about how we as visitors relate both to the museum collections and to his presentation of them. The museum visit is presented not simply as a cultural phenomenon for analysis, but as an experience, 
a right to be enacted, and that's reflected not just in pieces like this, but in some of the other vases, for example, as well. Um, Perry's emphasis on the role of intuition in his process of selection, on having chosen what he likes, is important here, I think. Caro and some of the other artists I artists might have used the opportunity to unpack and lay bare their artistic formation and influences. Perry instead explores his personal formation in almost psychoanalytic terms. I've not really shown you the pieces that make that point, but take my word for it. <laughs> um, what he's uniquely placed to reveal for us, it turns out, is not some insight into how a series of past artworks relate to one another visually, but rather how they relate to one another in his personal understanding of the world, his personal mythology. Through his exhibition and accompanying aspects of projects such as his visit to Germany as driver and bodyguard to Alan Measles, Perry performs this difference in approach, taking on the role of intuitive shaman rather than academic interpreter of meaning. I quote, Part of my role as an artist is similar to that of a shaman or witch doctor. I dress up, I tell stories, I give things meaning, and I make them a bit more significant. Like religion, this is not a rational process. I use my intuition. Sometimes our very human desire for meaning can get in the way of a good experience of the world. End quote. Visitor responses to evaluation suggest that the individual personal nature of Perry's written interpretation was highly valued, with comments including... It's very grounded, but it's very subjective, so that's quite interesting. It's not academic text. However, it's not simply that Perry had taken on the role of intuitive shaman. Visitors, too, were relied upon to participate in performing this difference in approach. By attending, they participated in Perry's reframing of the museum, and particularly his exhibition as a place of pilgrimage and wonderment rather than an intellectual experience. Audience research makes apparent how willingly many visitors embraced this approach, concluding that, I quote, Spiritual outcomes were particularly prominent among those visiting Grace and Perry, Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman, with 21% reporting a spiritual outcome as their main outcome, which is the second highest percentage of spiritual outcomes since the BM started counting in this particular way. Overall, 56% of visitors recorded a main outcome that the evaluators categorized as either spiritual or emotional. I'm not going to unpack now how we arrive at percentages of people who had a spiritual experience, but this is, this is the methodology that the BM was using over this period. And I think it is still, too, to segment, when people talk about their experience, to segment it into social, educational, emotional, and spiritual, and to kind of regard those as a, a hierarchy of depth of engagement. So this is what they were asking people, which I think is telling in itself about what they hope this, you know, their exhibitions might achieve. So Perry's presentation privileged intuition, imagination, fantasy, and personal response, implied these things had as much place in the museum as historical inquiry, and at the same time allowed a space for playfulness and humor as well as awe and wonder. And I don't have time here to go into detail, but to me this links into a few things. Um, on the one hand, into a set of concerns around how to encourage kind of deep engagement on a level that goes beyond the intellectual that was being voiced by a number of museum directors in sort of in the early noughties. Many of the essays in the 2004 book, Whose Muse, for example, have this kind of anxiety that, you know, as curators, we've kind of trained ourselves out of being able to respond emotionally to works of art, and yet that's what we hope people will do when they come to our museums. Um, and on the other hand, a growing interest among museum leaders in the UK at the moment anyway, um, in emotional engagement, not just with collections, but with issues. So to go beyond saying, okay, we fess up, we're not neutral, to saying, damn right, we're not neutral, we're going to campaign, why would you be neutral in this world? And we as museums, you know, we, we're up for campaigning and, and inviting an emotional response. And so I think it kind of, you know, it links into both those sets of thinking. Um, that's probably pretty much enough from me. I hope I've taken the opportunity of being the opening presentation to do just that, sort of open things up, rather than reach for neat conclusions. I've steered clear of giving you my, my bullet-pointed list of all the things that artist interventions in museums might hope to do and might do. Um, if you want that, <laughs> you can have it. Um, what I've sought to do with these three examples is show how artist interventions have been understood to have a transformative impact on how we experience museums and their collections, 
in different yet overlapping ways. So with the artist eye, the impact's understood in terms of how we experience and understand the individual work selected, encouraging us to see them differently by bringing them into new relation with other works of art, including the artist's own. Hacker's intervention, conforming most closely to our expectations of critique, encourages us not only to think differently about the specific institution, but also about our role as active and critical interrogators and constructors of meaning. And Perry broadens things out in a different way, encouraging personal meanings as well as political ones to find their way into our understanding of the objects in museums and what we're doing when we visit them. Um, I hope this Whistle Stop tour has provided some food for thought about the different nuanced roles that artist interventions have taken on, and I'm sure we'll be picking up on these possibilities and unpicking these and others throughout the day. Thanks for listening.